20. <sighs> Some of you know, last summer, in July, my parents passed three days apart. It was a big deal. And I had done a lot of work prior to that on that relationship, my relationship with my parents, in particular with my mother. She was the one who I couldn't buy a mushy card for on Mother's Day. I just would read them, well, that doesn't work. Well, this one doesn't work. Well, this one doesn't work. It was tricky. I was married in the 90s, and that first year, I went home four times, terribly homesick, even though it was a typically dysfunctional house. My mother, growing up, was very angry. She would say every once in a while she was angry with God because we would ask her, why don't you go to church? My dad took the six of us. She would yell often, at least daily. And she got to name calling as well. So I felt, you know, pretty tiny. What was interesting is when I went back that first year, one of those times happened to be around Mother's Day, and there I was, we're passing around the cards. All six of us were there celebrating. And we're reading the cards as they passed by. There wasn't a mushy one in the bunch. <laughs> and two of them were identical. <sighs> in the grace of presence. It's that awareness to suddenly understand something that you hadn't before. <sighs> Ten years later, my, hus my husband at the time and I were visiting. And, excuse me, we hadn't visited yet. My husband at the time got a DUI. He jumped into AA, I jumped into Al-Anon. Suddenly, I learned about codependency, triangulation. These were normal events growing up. They were still normal every time I went to visit. The sisters would try and figure out who, whose house we were going to meet at, and they would attempt to include me, but not really let me know. <laughs> ahead of time, just assume that I would show up. One of my sisters, she just was like that. She was one of those, um, perhaps she had boundary dysplasia. I'm glad you're laughing. <laughs> I want you to laugh. <laughs> so it would start off, somehow I would annoy her, and she'd yell, and I'd do the freeze. <laughs> then I would flee, yet she'd run after me <laughs> and cross the boundary, even if I'd stepped into another room and closed it <laughs> to yell some more. And then, of course, <laughs> then I was fighting. Briefly, but still it was enough that really just, it just, I didn't like to do that, you know. That was what I grew up with, that was what I learned, but I never liked, I never enjoyed it. I didn't get any pleasure out of that. And now, when I went back, I started asking more questions, because I also learned about a phrase called the adult child of an alcoholic. I was putting these things together, my mother's similarities and my ex-husband's similarities, mm -hmm. their personalities, <clears throat> their way of being in the world. If my mother didn't, didn't approve of something, I would try. I would try to get loud, too. But she would shut me down. She'd say something pretty unkind, you know, like, I don't want to hear from you. You're the last person, et cetera, et cetera. So I'd get louder. And she actually did this one time. So I learned it was a no-win situation, and I learned not to do that. Well, my husband would do this. 
same thing. I was still using those childhood reactions to manage communication with an adult. It wasn't working. What was fascinating, though, was now I wanted to go home and start asking about my mother's upbringing, my father's upbringing. Why were you so angry? Her dad passed when she was in seventh grade. I had never asked her what her mother did. What did your mother do? She said, I don't know, I guess we went on welfare. And then my mother got a job at the Hotel St. George, cleaning in New York City. They grew up in Brooklyn, both parents. Well, what did your brother do? She had an older brother and an older sister. She said, I don't know, he didn't work. Was he a drinker? She wouldn't tell. She swore her childhood was happy. I had a happy childhood. Was your dad a drinker? He only drank in the spring when he took the Mayflowers and made his own wine. That was the most I could get about her childhood and her upbringing. She just wasn't sharing. But I heard about my dad, who was the compassionate one, the sweet one. He, his parents, my grandparents, owned and operated a grocery store in Brooklyn during the Depression. We had no idea. They were not toot your own horns kind of people. <laughs> they, were, they were very private. My dad worked two jobs until he retired and sometimes three to put us through a Catholic school education all the way through high school. I, I still don't know how he did it. One time I was home from Kansas and looked at his paycheck. I was making more at that time than he was making. So I, st I really don't. But what I did learn is my mother was a big part of that. Memories started flooding back, how she'd stretch out a roast beef for a week. A pan of lasagna, that fed a lot of little kids because we had salad on the side. There was always a meat and a vegetable and a starch at night. Cereal for breakfast, peanut butter and jelly for lunch. I ate a lot of peanut butter and jelly on that lovely, lovely, soft, mushy white bread. <laughs> My parents, um, they did the finances together. They paid bills together. My mother would sit with my dad and write out. She taught me how to write a check. Make sure you have that little line after the pay to part and how to write out the cents, dollars and cents, and put it in that other little box. She was really a big part of keeping that household running. We always had something to eat. We always had clothes. Didn't need a uniform, because we had those in the Catholic schools we went to. Or excuse me, didn't need clothing for daytime. Didn't need a lot, but we always had new shoes for school. Anyway, somehow they managed. Somehow we managed. But a lot of that stuff stuck. And it stuck really well. At some point, living in, the, in Kansas became a breath of fresh air. I have to say, I had to get used to it. I didn't have to look behind my back when I was walking. Did I tell you I came from Hollis, Queens? That's where Run DMC came from. <laughs> or claim to fame. The outside world was not any more safe than inside that house. Thankfully, my mother went to sleep early, and when she slept, we all slept. <laughs> so I got a good night's sleep most days of my life. I also was mugged walking to the subway. My purse was taken. I was held up at the job I worked at twice, second time with a gun right here. My dad was robbed walking the dog. 
So this little body was really in turmoil for a long time. One person told me, a psychologist, it was after a, a special session with a healer woman, and the psychologist worked with her, and I called her the next week because stuff had come up during that time of the woman's presentation. And she said, you know, she said, you're not in your body. You're like up here. You're floating away. And that's what I used to do. I would run from the bus after work home a few blocks just to feel safe. There was a lot of running then. And she said, you have to be in your body. Otherwise, you're not protecting yourself. And I got it. I was like, wow, I need to be present so that I can actually move and see what's around me. So instead of being this little child that felt doing it, she did it, her work quietly, and you're going out into the world. It was a blessing. My relationship with my folks strengthened because of the distance. My mother started listening and asking me questions. I'd tell her about my friends in Kansas. She remembered year after year, and she would ask me, how is this one? How is that one? How are your three friends in New York? I kept in pretty good contact with them. What's going on? And then she'd tell me the scoop on everybody. All the nieces and nephews, especially who was sick. I think that was like a Catholic Italian thing. <laughs> what ailments everybody had that week. <laughs> My dad, one time, I called, and he was listening to Placido Domingo on PBS. So he asked, do you get PBS there? You know, Kansas is a totally another planet to most people in New York. It just is. I was like, yeah, let me see if it's linked up. Maybe Placido is singing here. And he was. So for about 10 minutes, we just listened to opera. It was really sweet, beautifully sweet. Now, a couple of my sisters, our relationship did not stay very close. One in particular just really didn't understand why I didn't come back, why I wasn't there. And that's really recently that I'm finding that out. But it makes sense because of how that one would hold on to anger, too. I knew they were passing, or within a few years, because I would hear, mom's doing worse, mom's not doing good, mom's not doing good. Three years of that, I started planning for, before, for, for that, for the eventuality. They were in their 80s and had many health issues. My mother focused on what she could do as an adult, and that was making sure we were fed and watered, you know. Her ankles were typically swollen. She'd try various things like grapefruits, you know. I think she did what she could to keep her pressure low. My dad worked constantly, so their bodies were, they, they were just giving up early. It seems early, because maybe 20 years in, they were, they were not moving so well. So they both had a, had a bout of cancer and got over it. Then there was the hypertension and the heart disease and diabetes. So all of it was ratcheting up. The last time I went back to New York and had a drive with my dad to shop, he, he immediately grabbed a cart. He was already hunched over. And he just needed something to hold on to. Those times were hard because my dad, at some point, decided to give my mother back verbally everything she had been feeding him. So this was a whole new upping of the ante. It was probably 2012, 2013. And it upset me to see that. But my response was to yell at my dad. 
to quiet down. <laughs> so it didn't make sense for me to be there. That's what I, I finally figured out. This is not healthy. It's just not healthy. But there I went the next year when the sisters called and my parent, my mother was in a wheelchair by then. The year before they were in the his and hers walkers. My dad had the tennis balls on the front. <laughs> it was hard. And they wanted me to stay over on my own and give my mother her shot, her insulin, and then spot them, particularly spot my mother when she was you know, on her trips to the ladies' room. By then, my mother was totally unfiltered. That's why my brother-in-law called it, Madeline Unfiltered. It was constant, 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 constant. So I told them I could do two days the first week and, three, and two days the second week. Set my boundaries. I stayed with friends on the front end, stayed with other friends on the back end of the trip. I stayed with my sister, Christine, who, who I get along with and her family for the other parts. But it was difficult. It was the most difficult trip I ever made home. And all the childhood wounds were opened up. It was as if an accelerant was being poured on now. My mother was yelling at the day lady. And my being there apparently didn't help. That just made her more anxious. Although there were a couple of moments of grace when I got to brush her hair. I figured that out the year before when I had tried to put a headset on to drown out my mother's yelling. And that just made her get louder. And then I did this, and that just made her get louder. It's like, OK, what can I do, spirit? What can I do? What can I do? <clears throat> because I had learned from A Course in Miracles that there is an expression of love or a call for love in every encounter. And if someone is calling for love, like my mother was in that moment, there had to be something that I could come back with that would help. And it was brushing her hair. The next time I was there, I used that as well. And it calmed her, it soothed her. I did a little, gave her a little scalp massage. And that, she loved that. Did a little energy work one day. And that was good. Took my tuning forks out another time. She didn't care for that. <laughs> probably too much, you know, that vibration, too much. We'd been in a good place, though, um, with that, those moments. So I had those moments. But I couldn't leave the space. There was nowhere to go. I didn't really know my place, even during the day. I didn't know what to do. My dad would call me Palma. My mother would call me Palma. So I was running. I was running. My mother didn't sleep. So neither did we. The last night I was there, my mother was bantering with my dad. I was, and I had taken to sleep on the sofa, which was a little farther away from the room I had been in. I still couldn't sleep, though. And she wasn't calling out for me. I was like, what is going on? So I went into the room. And my mother's in her pajamas on the bed. And she's got like a foot up on her, like over her other knee. And she looks kind of drunk, actually. <laughs> she's not, but she looks. And she's just standing there back and forth. Oh, you shut up. No, you shut up. No, you shut up. And then I turn. I come into the room. My mother turns. And she says, is that Palma? Come on in. Have a seat. And I looked at her and looked at him. I just looked. Left the, the room. I was pretty darn upset. <laughs> it's a funny image, and I'm glad I have it. I'm glad it's in my head because it was it was just so silly. It's just a silly memory. It's what I got home, and there are many more lovely moments of grace that I'm sure have come out of, out of that, um, and I would share if I could today.
But what I want to tell you is that when I got back to Kansas, I was going around telling my, my husband, Rich, I think I have PTSD. I think I have PTSD. I think I know what that is. I think this is it. My friend Mary had driven me to Queens. I was crying the whole time. She was crying driving with me. That was a moment of grace. Another time, I'm bringing them in anyway, these examples. Another time I, um, before I left, it was about 4.30 in the morning, and I remembered to text a friend. That was a friend here. I said, I can't find the love. I can't find the love. I can't find the love. And she texted back in real time, 3.30 in the morning. There is love there. You are love. They are love. It is there. I had a moment of peace. There were these moments of grace throughout. But again, the child was just... So, I had to find my healer person. Who, who do I need to go to? What's, what's the spirit? Who's out there to help me? And it came in a bulletin, um, a flyer that was up on the bulletin board here. It was from the Big Sky Retreat. There were a couple of them in 2015 on the board. So I pulled one, and I started looking at the presenters, and one immediately jumped out at me. Beautiful, bright eyes, smile, John Moore. Turns out, he was a Course in Miracles facilitator. He's a New Thought musician. And he was doing something called Family Constellation. That spoke immediately to me. Family Constellation is work that heals generationally. You work with your ancestors. You work with people maybe you, you haven't even met. You stand in their shoes. And I was ready. All the intuitive work, all the light work I had done, I was ready to receive information. I didn't know whose shoes I was standing in. He was in control of that part. This was all by phone. I was in my room. He asked me to put the footprints down. They were all numbered, so I had nine people. So where they were placed was, is significant who they're next to, who they're facing. It's all part of it. So it was wonderful to get perspective on my folks and my family members, totally different, and my ancestors, by standing in their shoes. Well, there was a second part. And the second part was an email. This is a prayer. I want you to speak it every day. He said, I'm thinking 40 days, but you'll know when to stop. I'm almost done. And I did it morning, noon, night, sometimes five times a day. Thank you, Mom and Dad, for doing your best. It is now time for me to reclaim my power, to stand on my own. I give you back your power. I had done this work years before in something called stalking. It's Don Miguel Ruiz's work with a, a, a student of his, um, Tess. And it was beautiful. So I was there doing my work, doing my work, doing my work, until something shifted in the neighborhood and brought my attention. It was traumatic. And my heart went there, my healing went to my neighbor and her family. And I stopped doing my intention. So I said, let me just count how many days I had done. It turned out it was 21 exactly which many behaviors say is exactly the amount of time that it takes if you're working consistently to shift a belief or a behavior or a habit. I had done it. I'll be back on July 30th to give you kind of a sweeter part, the part since then, the year before my parents died, the forgiveness work I did, the beautiful, what I call angel kisses that happened before and during the services even and after. Thank you.